I wanted a place for people to receive authentic guidance and practical ways to awaken. Thought-provoking, paradigm-shifting, and empowering. This is about expanding our human consciousness to create a wave of new possibilities. I'm Dr. Teresa willard White, and this is Quantum Minds TV. back to Quantum Minds TV, where we take a deep dive into various perspectives on what it's going to take to create a shift in human consciousness. In this episode, we're continuing the conversation with Steve Rees, who is a sound healer, musician, and researcher into healing frequencies. And with uh, your music, now you've been uh, working with different tuning scales, if I recall. And, you know, most people, maybe they don't recognize or realize that that most of the music we tend to be exposed to in our modern world is tuned on uh, a scale of 440 hertz. Is that correct? Right. Yeah, that's the A note that's used for calibrating. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's become the standard. But it, it, it wasn't always the case, right? This wasn't always the standard. There's many different ways of, of tuning the scale, uh, working with the octave from a different um, sort of bass note. Uh, so maybe you can share a little bit about these different tuning scales and how you work with, with this, with the heart music. Yeah. Um, okay, where to start? Let's see. Um, well, the one thing that, I first paid attention to was uh, Matsuro Emoto's work um, on the healing qualities of the 528 frequency on water structure. And that really got my attention because, um, and I also I had run across uh, Leonard Horowitz um, who had written the 528 book and uh, another healing codes. And so, um, I was beginning to be aware, and I'll just back up one second. Every time I tuned my harp, I would tune it just a little bit sharp because it just sounded better to me. And I didn't, I couldn't have told you why, (laughs) but it did. Well, then I started looking into this 528 and what Dr. Horowitz was saying. And I'm going like, well, maybe that's why I tuned sharp because um, to get to 520, see, normally if you use the 440 to tune with, you're gonna get to the C note and it's gonna be 523 Hertz. Mm -hmm. And that's not 528, it's a little bit flat. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, so both of, uh, well, actually uh, Leonard, uh, in Leonard's book, Joseph Puglio had done a chapter with him on frequencies out of the scripture, out of the Bible, the ancient Hebrew text. And in that, indicated that we needed to go to the 444 for the A note so that when we got to the C note, it would be 528 instead of 523. Mm-hmm. And that kind of clicked in my brain. I'm going like, well, that must be why I'm tuning sharp all the time because I think that's where I'm supposed to be. And so mm-hmm. um, so that kind of led into further study along the, the frequencies. Um, but that's what got me started. Now, Since that, and I've published that work, you know, my life in 528 is a free download I have on my website. Um, But there's a lot of people that are connecting with the 432 um, calibration for the A note, which is would be flat. But the reason why that one is important, and I don't, I don't think it's an either or. I think it's a yes and yes kind of understanding. Mm -hmm because I look at the 432 as the natural frequency. It's it's tied into the Fibonacci numbers. It's tied in with the golden mean. Um, Everything that is, all of the angles of polygons that are, uh, when you start adding those up, you come up to the, everything that's divisible by the, into the 432. So all of that is is important. And so I would call that um, the natural world or the geometric. And as I studied more into the, the, the scripture side of things with the 444, I see that as the, as the sacred or the or, um, worshipful or the, so there's 
there's two different parts of our life that they're, they're inter, intertwined, but they're, but they're, 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 they're parts of us. And so we need to address the spiritual, but we also need to address the natural. And I, mm-hmm. I like what you're talking about science and spirituality combining that. That's really what this all represents, I think. So maybe the, the natural kind of works more with our physical, you know, the physicality right. of things and then the, the uh, more spiritual, you know, the sacred works with that, you know, inner frequency and spiritual. Absolutely, yeah. They've also shown, I believe that there've been some studies that have shown that the 528 Hertz uh, affects the DNA as well. Is that Absolutely, uh, something yeah. that you've explored into much at all? Well, I have a couple articles um, that show that the, um, those who are doing genetic research, a lot of times they'll do repair strands with 528 frequency. So there definitely is a connection there. Yeah. Yeah. So that would say that, uh, you know, that when we listen to music that is, you know, has a lot of that 528 hertz frequency yeah. in it, that it really is communicating to support our, our DNA to heal, to repair. Uh, and this is one of the things that in uh, Horowitz's book that they you know, really highlighted with the various solfeggio frequencies right. that this 528 Hertz was you know, the miracle frequency, so to speak, that really right. worked with the DNA and, and healing, but all of the different frequencies, you know, there's multiple like seven or nine different frequencies that could right. be derived numerologically uh, and and you know can also be found within various bible passages that um you know it's almost like it's when when you look at the bible for example and it's written in the hebrew and then the hebrew often had a numerological system to it and one of the ways of decoding uh, and finding that there were hidden messages within the, the biblical writings was to look at the numerological correspondences right, right. and and then see where you know certain numbers came up, for example, with different words, but those numbers would be the core essence, the hidden essence between them, and it would be linked when they had the same number. Um, so the numerology aspect of, of all of this really reveals the hidden meaning, the hidden essence. Um, and so when you know we look at the solfeggio frequencies, for example, it's very much a numerological system. Um, and yet each the solfeggio frequencies, they don't necessarily all fall on one tuning scale together. They it's each all, are their own separate tuning scales. As, Is that yeah. correct? Yeah. And that was, um, I had never heard anybody talk about this before. I always, everybody always talks, even today, a lot of people I talk with talk about the solfeggio scale, and it's not a scale. They're actually separate frequencies. And I was up in Canada one time with some friends of ours. She's also a harpist. Uh, we actually made her a harp up there. Um, and we were, she had a set of tuning forks that was in the Sofagio, all of them. And we were trying to play music on it. There was just no way you could do it. It didn't make any sense. <laughs> and so we're going like, what's this all about? You know, so... I just had this thought, and I'm probably Holy Spirit inspired, but um, I played one note, but I started with the 520. I said, I just rang it and I said, what um, key has all of the notes harmonizing with that note? So I call it harmonic, uh, harmonic scale. Um, which, which scale, which key, so the key of C, key of D, key of, you know, all of the major scales and minors as well. Um, Which one everything harmonizes? Well, that was the key of C. Also the key of F uh, harmonized well with it as well. And so when you play your music in that key of C major and you have that tone going, everything's in harmony all the time. There's no disharmony going. And so, so then we went. Well, let's take a look at the at the seven forty one, and uh, same thing with that. It was a different key, and I don't have it on top of my brain right now. But anyway, each one of those frequencies represented a different major key, and that started to make some really interesting sense because 
when you go in scripture to Isaiah 22, verse 22, it says, I will place upon his shoulder the keys of David. And we always think keys that open doors and things like that. But what about thinking in musical keys? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And whatever he opens, not, no one should shut. And whatever he shuts, no man can open. So that maybe these this music and what we're discovering now with this ease and disease and everything else, has something to do with what's being stated there in that Keys of David. Oh, and so it just made it a whole new way of looking at things. That's really <laughs> fascinating because I, I know some uh, from some of the cymatics research that's been done where they're looking at the effect of sound on the physical. They also have um, done some maybe ultrasound type of uh, studies where they listened to each organ, for example. Right. And each organ had a unique signature frequency or sound pattern. Um, and when it was in, in health, uh, it was in harmony. And when it was diseased, it was in disharmony and something would disrupt the natural frequency of that, of that organ. And so when we then take that and, and reverse that, we can also say, well, what sounds do we need to put in to the body that help create that harmony and healing within that organ that might be diseased, right? So this is where the sound healing process comes in again. Well, that you bring up a very interesting point. Um, I have a friend that's a naturopath and she asked if she could buy some of my uh, CD. I have one CD that's called Tabernacle Prayer, which has a a composition in each one of the solfeggio frequencies. I like to call them tabernacle frequencies because of where they're located in scripture. Um, and what she was doing with them is she would find out which organ system a person was having a problem with. And she would send the CD home with them and have them listen to which one of the compositions ministered best to their issue. And amazingly, each time what she had identified as their system problem, the organ issue that was always in combination with one of the frequencies that was, when you look at the, at the chakras yeah, and the organs that are with each one, it was always lined up with the one. So the frequency that I, the composition was in was addressing the organ that was in that system that was in that frequency so mm -hmm. it was so she was she bought a whole bunch of them and was passing them out to her people she was working with she said here try this so actually i'm currently my current project i'm taking each one of those compositions and expanding them into a full cd so that a person who has identified one frequency that's administering to them the best can have a whole one that they can just play as long as they want so so that's, that's, that's my latest project. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, and yes, yeah, so we know from ancient wisdom teachings, you know, both uh, like in the yogic tradition, for example, they do assign different notes or frequency levels to the chakras. Same thing in the Kabbalistic system, there's different corresponding notes sure. uh, that, that correspond with each of the uh, spheres on the tree, the spherot. Uh, on the tree of life. And these are energy centers within our own body. Both right. the chakras and the tree of life are yeah. different energy centers within us. And they have various correspondences with the organs and so forth. And, you know, there is this principle in, in the ancient hermetic teachings that saw, talks about uh, the principle of vibration. It says everything vibrates, everything right. moves, nothing is, nothing is still and in addition to this principle of vibration with everything always vibrating, which always also works with the principle of sound and harmonics, uh, you have the principle of rhythm, you know, that there's the ebb and the flow and the rise and the fall and that rhythm uh, to, to life and to everything that we do. And so when you bring these two principles together, vibration and rhythm, it very much works with the principles of sound and music and harmonics and resonance and entrainment again. And, and it's like, these were ancient technologies that were used to bring health. And I believe that very much that there were um, in various indigenous cultures, 
uh, as well as in ancient Egypt and some of the temples, uh, as well as in you know ancient Vedic system and with some of the ragas, you know they the and, and obviously in the biblical system with some of the the songs, um, there was always this understanding that, that music had a healing effect right. and could be used to alter consciousness. It could be used to create health and healing. It could be used to uh, generate more energy. It can be used to soothe. Uh, so there's so many different ways in which we can use music. Um, so you've explored it in the biblical sense quite a bit and, and how it's embedded within uh, various passages and chapters in the Bible. Uh, can you share a little bit more about what you have found in your discovery process there? Well, yeah, and that's a whole other story. Because <laughs> when I was when I was um, seeing the effects on my patients in hemodialysis, um, I started, you know, and I'm playing a harp here, and I'm thinking, harp David, okay. Um, so so I started wondering, does anybody know what David's? You know, because there's a text in First Kings chapter 16 that says that the king Saul had a troubling spirit, and they got David to come and play his harp. And when he played his harp, the troubling spirit left. And so I'm going like, well, that's kind of what I'm seeing here. In, in, in you know, depending on the language that somebody's using, what they're trying to describe. Um, so. I thought, well, does anybody know what David's psalms would have sounded like? Because the psalms actually are a songbook, but there doesn't seem to be any sheet music around <laughs> to know what it sounded like. So then I began to look at the Hebrew language and think about, well, you know, the gematria, the, um, it's a pictographic language. Uh, and I saw uh, some um, Khalidi um, sand plate. Uh, where they would actually speak a Hebrew letter into the sand plate. And for some of the letters, they would actually form a, the letter in the wow. sand shape. So it's like the and cymatic went, shape of the letter. So it was a cymatic shape, yeah. And so that led me to think, okay, so maybe there is a connection between the sound of the letter and the shape of the letter. Would there then, could by knowing the shape of the, the, knowing which letter, maybe we would know which sound. That that was where my brain was working. And so then I ran into uh, Dr. Pulio's work, uh, Joseph Pulio's work with uh, Leonard Horowitz, and he described um, a system. So we talk about gematria in the Hebrew language where each letter has a number. Well, there's another system as well called the Pythagorean system in which if you have, let's say the number 19 is, is a, a two digit number or any 191 or whatever, three digits. Well, Pythagoras liked to work everything down to simple. So he would keep adding the numbers until he got it down to a single digit. So like 19 is one plus nine, which is 10, but that's one plus zero. So now you have one. And so by going to numbers chapter seven, and, and I give Joseph Pulio's credit for this. He said he got a direct download from, from the Holy Spirit on this. Um, that from verse 12 through 83, every six verses is saying exactly the same thing, except it's a different tribe. Because it's the dedication of the tabernacle that Moses mm -hmm. built in the wilderness. So when you do Pythagorean numbers on those verse numbers, you end up with these pat these three digit patterns that repeat four times. Now, in Hebrew language, if something repeats twice, it means you need to pay attention to it. <laughs> it some, some scholars call it a speed bump. In other words, slow down or flashing light or, you know. For those so, who have like eyes it's, to see and ears to hear, right? <laughs> yeah, if it's shalom, shalom, or destruction, destruction, or whatever, it means that there's a whole lot more being said there. And so we have here a repeat of 12 times. And then when you work those numbers, it's a repeat of four times. So there's something very clearly being that's embedded in here for us to pay attention to. And so you start to ask the question, well, what does a three digit number describe? 
Well, one thing it describes is a hertz for the sound, and a hertz is a note. And so then um, Joseph Pulio went over to Psalm 119, which is an acrostic. And so every eight verses is, is the first letter of the first word of each of those verses is the first letter Aleph, then the second letter Bet, and third letter Gimel, and then Dalit all the way through the Aleph Bet. And so now you, if you do the Pythagorean numbers there, you now have a Pythagorean number for a letter moving over to a Pythagorean number for a note. So now you have a note to letter combination or coordination. And so now you can go to the Hebrew text and go letter to note, letter to note, letter to note, and end up with a, a melody line. But the melody lines didn't work out real well, so I was at. So I, I think I got an um, inspiration on this one. Instead of looking at note to note to note, look at the notes that are in a word and play notes together, which is a chord. Mm -hmm. So when you go word to word to word, you now have chord to chord to chord, which is chord progression, which is how music works. Okay. And so now I had a direct link. To, somebody said, um, you um, decoded the songs. I said, well, I didn't, hadn't looked at it that way. But, but you know, so then I, the final thing was, in, in fact, uh, I had this, um, in fact, I think I gave Rachel a, a uh, I did Psalm 23 was my first endeavor at this, to take those chord progressions and look for what I call music phrasing. So like chorus, verse, maybe a bridge kind of thing, and put those together into a composition. Mm -hmm. So if, if she wanted to play that um, Psalm 23, that, that'd give people a, a sample of what that sounded like. So. Yeah, we'll definitely play that sample. Uh, let's take a listen now. So that was uh, beautiful. And I love how you had this intuitive sense, you know, from a musically trained place to look at the, the chords and the chord progression, not just single notes, but to, you know, really bring the musicality to it all. But it makes me wonder also if the numerology was pointing to frequencies of notes, it makes you wonder how, if they even knew about hertz and frequencies back in those <laughs> biblical times. And if they did, uh, then they must have had some higher knowledge or, you know, ancient wisdom that understood it from a technological place and not just uh, an, a creative and artistic place. Well, you know, that's a really interesting point. Um, first of all, uh, David is considered by 
most within the, the Jewish tradition as a prophet. And so prophets were, were known to have um, special knowledge that God gave them, either direct verbiage or, or intuition or whatever, or vision even, you know. So, so that could be part of the issue. The second thing is, I think Darwin, with his evolution theory, got us into big trouble because he makes, he makes us think that we start out with knuckle-dragging Neanderthals and we, we progress little by little through the millions of years to where we are today and it's getting better as we go. Right, through random I think, <laughs> and there's some evidence to show this, that there's a whole lot of technology that has been lost. Mm. And so I don't have any problem thinking that David knew exactly what he was doing. <laughs> mm. so. Yeah, I agree with you. You know, we, we, there's so much evidence on this planet of, of ancient wisdom, technology, right. deep understanding, and somewhere along the way, maybe we've lost it because we've become modernized or secularized, or we've we've moved away from uh, those wisdoms, ancient wisdoms, and you know, taken on this mindset that we were more primitive back then and more advanced now. But you know, evolution actually doesn't show that. No, it uh, doesn't. It's just it really doesn't. That shows that. Yeah. So. No, I think there is plenty of technology to be able to put this all together many years ago. <laughs> mm. Well, I, I absolutely love how, you know, in, in your work and, and Horowitz and Puello, their work with the, the Bible and the solfeggio frequencies, and then now you've actually brought it not just from a, a theory of researching it, but to playing it and bringing in the intuitive part to mix it in with the music and, and working with a harp that, that David also worked with. Um, and it, the harp has just such a ethereal and beautiful uh, sound to it. We actually had a, a harp player for our wedding because we, oh. it just was just the right uh, frequency and, you know, just kind of hit the right chords yeah, <laughs> literally uh, and metaphorically. And yeah. um you know, with the with the solfeggio frequencies, if we can just come back to that for a moment, you know, you mentioned earlier, some people, you know, would say, oh, it's the 444 tuning scale, and they're just saying it's the 432, but actually it's both. And, and then when we look at all the solfeggio frequencies, they're all different tuning scales. That's right. And, yeah. and what I have found is that all of them are good because every single one of them is going to challenge you to listen differently right. and and it's going to challenge your brain even to to perceive new frequencies and new ways and things that you maybe aren't so used to hearing and all of a sudden it's having it's it, it's creating new neural connections just to listen to yeah. these new tuning scales and we even see for example in the indian uh tuning scales they have like this 12 note system and they have notes that we're not used to hearing so when you listen to uh some of the ragas like ravi shankar or anushka shankar you know or some of the modern people who are doing the sitar uh music they also like will challenge us to listen and you right. might listen to it multiple times and always hear something new or different because you weren't used to hearing it before right. absolutely so, so these these tuning scales, I think, um, and bringing the consciousness to it and bringing the awareness and the intentional use of them uh, is really one of the ways in which we can use music and these new uh, or ancient, I should say, tuning scales to help us shift consciousness, to help us expand our awareness, yeah. uh, which is one of the themes of this whole series of Quantum Minds TV, which is what, what, what's it going to take to create a shift in human consciousness? Join us again as we continue to dive deeper into this fascinating conversation with Steve Breeze on all things healing music and sound in the next episode. This Conscious Conversation was created, produced, and recorded by Dr. Teresa Bullard-Wyke in collaboration with Steve Rees and edited by HH Films and Photo. The theme music was created by Tim Mountain of Evenload Productions. Quantum Minds TV is a product of the Quantum Learning Academy.